pressed beyond endurance, at last turned upon Napoleon with an act of defiance that startled and delighted Russia. December 1 Romanzov communicated to Collincourt the Tsar's refusal to seize, confiscate, or shut his ports against colonial produce 331 at about the same time the merchants of St. Petersburg framed a memorial to the Imperial Council, asking for a general prohibition of French luxuries as the only means of preventing the drain of specie and the further depreciation of the paper currency. On this memorial a hot debate occurred in the Imperial Council. Romanzov opposed the measure as tending to a quarrel with France, and when overruled, he insisted on entering his formal protest on the journal 332 The Tsar acquiesced in the majority's decision, and December 19 the Imperial Ukase appeared, admitting American produce on terms remarkably liberal, but striking a violent blow at the industries of France. Napoleon replied by recalling Colin Court and by sending a new ambassador, Count Lauriston, to St. Petersburg, carrying with his credentials an autograph letter to the Tsar 333 Your Majesty's last ukase, said this letter, in substance, but particularly in form, is directed specially against France. In other times, before taking such a measure against my commerce, your Majesty would have let me know it, and perhaps I might have suggested means which, while accomplishing your chief object, might still have prevented it from appearing a change of system in the eyes of France. All Europe has so regarded it, and already, in the opinion of England and of Europe, our alliance exists no longer. If it were as entire in Your Majesty's heart as in mine, this general impression would be none the less a great evil. For myself, I am always the same, but I am struck by the evidence of these facts, and by the thought that Your Majesty is wholly disposed, as soon as circumstances permit it, to make an arrangement with England, which is the same thing as to kindle a war between the two empires. Adams's diplomatic victory was Napoleonic in its magnitude and completeness. Even Colin Court, whom he overthrew, good-naturedly congratulated him after he had succeeded, against Colin Court's utmost efforts, in saving all the American ships. It seems you are great favorites here, you have found powerful protection, said the defeated Ambassador 334. The American minister felt but one drawback he could not wholly believe that his victory was sure. Anxious by temperament, with little confidence in his own good fortune fighting his battles with energy, but rather with that of despair than of hope the younger Adams never allowed himself to enjoy the full relish of a triumph before it staled, while he never failed to taste with its fullest flavor, as though it were a precious wine, every drop in the bitter cup of his defeats. In this, the most brilliant success of his diplomatic career, he could not be blamed for doubting whether such fortune could last. That the Tsar of Russia should persist in braving almost sure destruction in order to defend American rights which America herself proclaimed to be unassailed, past the bounds of fiction. Yet of all the facts with which Monroe, April 1, 1811, had to deal, this was the most important that Russia expected to fight France in order to protect neutral commerce. Already, December 27, 1810, Adams notified his government that Russia had determined to resist to the last, and that France had shown a spirit of hostility that proved an intention to make war. A few weeks later he wrote that military movements on both sides had begun on such a scale that the rumor of war was universal 335 Napoleon's harangue of March 24, 1811, to the Paris Chamber of Commerce was accepted in Russia as the announcement of a coming declaration, and the Russians waited uneasily for the blow to be struck which the Tsar would not himself strike. They waited, but Napoleon did not move. Hampered by the Spanish War and by the immense scale on which a campaign in Russia must be organized, he consumed time in diplomatic remonstrances which he knew to be useless. April 1, 1811, a week after his tirade to the Paris merchants, he dictated another lecture to the Tsar, 
through Count Lauriston 336 Doubtless the smugglers will try every means of forming connections with the continent, but that connection I will cut, if necessary, with the sword. Until now I have been indulgent, but this year I am determined to use rigor toward those who are concerned in contraband. A great convoy, he said, was at that moment collecting in English ports for the Baltic, but the goods thus introduced would be everywhere seized, even in Russia, whatever might be said to the contrary, because the Emperor Alexander has declared his wish to remain at war with the English as the only means of maintaining the peace of the continent. A few days afterward, April 5th, Kador was ordered to write again 337 It is probable that the least appearance of a peace with England will be the signal of war unless unforeseen circumstances lead the emperor to prefer to gain time. Alexander wished the moral advantage of appearing to be attacked, and he allowed Napoleon to gain time in these pretended remonstrances. Romanzov replied to them as seriously as though they were seriously meant. Once he quoted the American minister as authority for the genuine character of the admitted vessels. Napoleon treated the appeal with contempt 338 let him know that there are no American ships, that all pretended American ships are English, or freighted on English account, that the English stop American vessels and do not let them navigate, that if the American minister sustains the contrary, he does not know what he is talking about. The American minister no longer needed to sustain the contrary, he had passed that stage, and had to struggle only with the completeness of his success. Although a large British squadron kept the Baltic open to commerce, few British merchantmen visited those waters in 1811. Their timidity was due to the violence with which Napoleon had seized and destroyed British property in 1810 wherever he found it, without respecting his own licenses. In consequence of British abstention, American vessels swarmed in Russian ports. In July, 1811, Adams wrote that 200 American ships had already arrived 339 and that Russia was glutted with colonial goods until the cargoes were unsaleable at any price, while the great demand for return cargoes of Russian produce had raised the cost of such articles to extravagance. America enjoyed a monopoly of the Baltic trade, and Adams's chief difficulty, like that of Napoleon, was only to resist the universal venality which made of the American flag a cover for British smuggling. Adams seemed unable to ask a favor which the Tsar did not seem eager to grant, for in truth the result of admitting American ships pleased the friendly Tsar and his people, who obtained their sugar and coffee at half cost, and sold their hemp and naval stores at double prices. The Russians knew well the price they were to pay in the end, but in the meantime Napoleon became more and more pacific. If war was to come in 1811, everyone supposed it would be announced in the French emperor's usual address to his legislative body, which opened its session June 16. The address was brought in hot haste by special courier to Street Petersburg, but to the surprise of everyone it contained no allusion to Russia. As usual, Napoleon pointed in the direction he meant not to take, and instead of denouncing Russia, he prophesied disaster to the victorious English in Spain when England shall be exhausted, when she shall have felt at last the evils that she has for twenty years poured with so much cruelty over the continent, when half of her families shall be covered by the funeral veil then a thunderstroke will end the peninsula troubles and the destinies of her armies, and will avenge Europe and Asia. By closing this second Punic War. This Olympian prophecy meant only that Napoleon, for military reasons, preferred not to invade Russia until 1812. As the question of neutral trade was but one of the pretexts on which he forced Russia into war, and as it had served its purpose, he laid it aside. He closed the chapter August 25th by directing his ambassador, Lauriston, to cease further remonstrance 340-150 ships, he said, under false American colors had arrived in Russia, the projects of Russia were unmasked, she wanted to renew her commerce with England, 
she no longer preserved appearances, but favoured in every way the English trade, further remonstrance would be ridiculous and diplomatic notes useless. War for the spring of 1812 was certain. So much harm, at least, the Americans helped to inflict on Napoleon in return for the millions he cost them, but even this was not their whole revenge. The example of Russia found imitation in Sweden, where Napoleon was most vulnerable. Owing to a series of chances, Bernadotte, who happened to command the French Army Corps at Hamburg, was made Prince of Sweden in October, 1810, and immediately assumed the government of the kingdom. Bernadotte as an old republican, like Lucien Bonaparte, never forgave Napoleon for betraying his party, and would long since have been exiled like Moreau had he not been the brother-in-law of Joseph and a reasonably submissive member of the imperial family. Napoleon treated him as he treated Louis, Lucien, Joseph, Jerome, Eugene, and Joachim Murat loading them with dignities, but exacting blind obedience, and instantly on the new king's accession, the French minister informed him that he must within five days declare war on England. Bernadotte obeyed. Napoleon next required the confiscation of English merchandise and the total stoppage of relations between Sweden and England 341 as in the case of Holland and the Baltic powers, this demand included all American ships and cargoes, which amounted to one half of the property to be seized. Bernadotte either could not or would not drag his new subjects into such misery as Denmark and Holland were suffering, and within five months after his accession, he already found himself threatened with war. Tell the Swedish minister, said Napoleon to Cador 342 that if any ship loaded with colonial produce be it American or Danish or Swedish or Spanish or Russian is admitted into the ports of Swedish Pomerania, my troops and my customs officers shall immediately enter the province. Swedish Pomerania was the old province still held by Sweden on the south shore of the Baltic, Next to Mecklenburg, and Stralsund, its capital, was a nest of smugglers who defied the emperor's decrees. In March, 1811, Dave Out, who commanded at Hamburg, received orders 343 to prepare for seizing Stralsund at the least contravention of the commercial laws. Bernadotte's steps were evidently taken to accord with those of the Tsar Alexander, and at last Napoleon found himself in face of a Swedish as well as a Russian, Spanish, and English war. In the case of Russia, American commerce was but one though a chief cause of rupture, but in the case of Sweden it seemed to be the only cause. In August, Napoleon notified the Tsar of his intentions against Stralsund, in November, he gave the last warning to Sweden and in both cases he founded his complaints on the toleration shown to American commerce by Bernadotte. November 3, 1811, he wrote to Bassano, if the Swedish government does not renounce the system of escorting by its armed ships the vessels which English commerce covers with the American flag, you will order the charge d'affaire to quit Stockholm with all the legation. He returned again and again to the grievance, if Sweden does not desist from this right of escorting American ships which are violating the decrees of Berlin and Milan, and maintains the pretension to attack my privateers with her ships of war, the charge d'affaire will quit Stockholm. I want to preserve peace with Sweden this wish is palpable but I prefer war to such a state of peace. 344 Once more the accent of truth sounded in these words of Napoleon. He could not want war with Sweden, but he made it because he could not otherwise enforce his Berlin and Milan decrees against American commerce. Although a part of that commerce was fraudulent, Napoleon, in charging fraud, wished to condemn not so much the fraudulent as the genuine. In order to enforce his Berlin and Milan decrees against American commerce, he was, as Cador had threatened, about to overturn the world. This was the situation when Joel Barlow, the new American minister to France, arrived at Paris September 19, 1811, bringing instructions dated July 26, 
the essence of which was contained in a few lines 345 it is understood, said the President, that the blockade of the British Isles is revoked. The revocation having been officially declared, and no vessel trading to them having been condemned or taken on the high seas that we know of, it is fair to conclude that the measure is relinquished. It appears, too, that no American vessel has been condemned in France for having been visited at sea by an English ship, or for having been searched or carried into England, or subjected to impositions there. On the sea, therefore, France is understood to have changed her system. Of all the caprices of politics, this was the most improbable that at the moment when the Tsar of Russia and the King of Sweden were about to risk their thrones and to face the certain death and ruin of vast numbers of their people in order to protect American ships from the Berlin and Milan decrees, the new Minister of the United States appeared in Paris authorized to declare that the President considered those decrees to be revoked and their system no longer in force. End of Vol. V Footnotes, One Diary of J.Q. Adams, March 4, 1809, I 544. Two Diary of J.Q. Adams, I 544. Three W.C. Nicholas II. Nicholas Manuscripts for Robert Smith's Address to the People, June 7, 1811. Five First Administration of Jefferson, Volume IP 188. Six Gallatin to Jefferson. November 8, 1809, Adams's Gallatin, p. 408. 7 Madison to Henry Lee, February, 1827, Works, 3. 562, 564. 8 National Intelligencer, July, 1811. 9 Gallatin to Samuel Smith, June 26, 1809, Adams's Gallatin, p. 402. 10 Henry to Craig, March 13, 1809, State Papers, 3. 55011 State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, pages 897, 898. 12 Gallatin's Report, April 17, 1810. State Papers, Finance, 2. 427 13 Gallatin's Report, April 17, 1810, State Papers, Finance, 2. 435 14 Gallatin's Report, April 17, 1810, State Papers, Finance, 2. 436 15 Gallatin's Report, April 17, 1810, State Papers, Finance, 2. 428 16 Gallatin's Report, April 17, 1810, State Papers, Finance, 2. 439 17 History of First Administration of Jefferson, I 224. 18 Correspondence de Napoleon, XXXII. 265, 272, 359 to 370. 19 Correspondence de Napoleon, XXXII. 366, 20 Napoleon to Jerome, 16 John Vere, 1809, Correspondence, 18. 237, 21 Correspondence, 18. 225 22 Correspondence, 18. 227 23 Armstrong to Madison, October 25, 1808, Manuscript State Department Archives. 24 Armstrong to Madison, November 24, 1808, Manuscript State Department Archives. 25 Gallatin's Writings, 2. 490 26 Armstrong to Madison, January 2, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 27 Champagny to Turo, December 10, 1808, 
Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 28 Turo to Champagne, March 19, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 29 Erskine to Canning, March 17, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 30 Turo to Champagne, April 15, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 31 Turo to Champagne, April 20, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 32 Turo to Champagne, April 22, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 33 Turo to Champagne, June 1, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts C.F. Madison to Jefferson, May 1, 1809, Writings, 2. 440 34 Act of Geo 3. 1808, Cap XXVI. American State Papers, 3. 274 35 Pinckney to Madison, December 25, 1808, Wheaton's Pinckney. 36 Pinckney to Canning, December 28, 1808, State Papers, 3. 240 37 Canning to Perceval, December 31, 1808, Perceval Manuscripts 38 Took's History of Prices, I 274 279. 39 Brougham to Gray, November 25, 1809, Brougham's Memoirs, I 417, Temples Courts and Cabinets, 4. 276, 283, Canning to the Duke of Portland, March 24, 1809, Walpole Spencer Perceval, I-347, 350. 40 Canning to Erskine, January 23, 1809, Cobbett's Debates, 17, 6. 41 Pinckney to Madison, January 23, 1809, Wheaton's Pinckney, p. 420. 42 Cobbett's Debates, 12. 25 43 Cobbett's Debates, p. 69. 44 Pinckney to Madison, January 23, 1809, Wheaton's Pinckney, p. 423. 45 Brief Account, etc. January 23, 1809, State Papers, 3. 299 46 Pinckney to Madison, January 23, 1809, Wheaton's Pinckney, p. 424. 47 Pinckney to R. Smith, June 6, 1809, State Papers, 3. 303 48 Canning to Erskine, January 23, 1809, American State Papers, 3. 349 Second Administration of Jefferson, Volume 4. Pages 388 to 389. 50 Pinckney to R. Smith, June 23, 1809, State Papers, 3. 303 51 W. H. Fremantle to the Marquis of Buckingham, February 16, 1809, Courts and Cabinets of George III, 4. 318 52 Cobbett's Debates, 12. 771 803. 53 Cobbett's Debates, 13. App No. 2, XXXI. 54 Order in Council of April 26, 1809, State Papers, 3. 241 55 Pinckney to Madison, May 3, 1809, Wheaton's Pinckney, p. 428. 56 Pinckney to R. Smith, May 1, 1809. 
Manuscript State DEP Archives. 57 Erskine to Canning, April 18, 1809, Cobbett's Debates, 17. Appendix, Xlady. 58 Erskine to R. Smith, April 17, 1809, State Papers, 3. 295 59 Robert Smith's Address to the People, 1811. 60 Erskine to Canning, August 3, 1809, Cobbett's Debates, 17. Clvy 61 Erskine to Canning, April 30, 1809, August 7, 1809. Erskine to Robert Smith, August 14, 1809. Cobbett's Debates, 17. CLICLXX. State Papers, 3. 30562 Turo to Champagny, June 1, 1809, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscript 63 Madison to Jefferson, April 24, 1809, Madison's Writings, 2. 43964 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 210. 65 Madison to Jefferson, June 12, 1809, Madison's Writings, 2. 44366 Message of June 15, 1809, State Papers, 3. 29767 Madison to Jefferson, June 20, 1809, Madison's Writings, 2. 44368 Turo to Smith, June 14, 1809. John Graham to the editors of the Federal Republican, August 31, 1813. Niles, v. 37 to 40. 69 Turo to Champagny, June 14, 1809. Archives to F. ETR. Manuscript 70 Ryland to Henry, May 1, 1809, State Papers, 3. 552 71 Canning to Erskine, May 22, 1809, Cobbett's Debates, 17. Aptzi. 72 Canning to Erskine, May 23, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 73 Pinckney to Robert Smith, June 23, 1809, State Papers, 3. 30374 The Courier, May 26, 1809. 75 Erskine to Canning, August 7, 1809, Cobbett's Debates, 17 APCL Exclusi 8. 76 Pinckney to R. Smith, May 28, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 77 Pinckney to Madison, December 10, 1809, Wheaton's Pinckney, p. 434. 78 Pinckney to R. Smith, June 23, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 79 Bath Archives, Diaries and Letters of Sir George Jackson, 2. 44780 Bath Archives, Diaries and Letters of Sir George Jackson, 2nd Series, I-109. 81 Bath Archives, Diaries and Letters of Sir George Jackson, 2nd Series, I-24, 46. 82 Canning to F.J. Jackson, NOS 1-5, July 1, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives, America, Volume XCV. 83 Gallatin to Montgomery, July 27, 1809, Adams's Gallatin, p. 395. 84 Gallatin to Montgomery, July 27, 1809, Adams's Gallatin, p. 395. 85 Madison to Gallatin, July 28, 1809, Gallatin's Works, I-454. 86 Madison to Jefferson, 
August 3, 1809, Madison's Works, 2. 44987 Bath Archives, 2nd Series, I-9. 88 Gallatin to Madison, September 11, 1809, Works I-461. 89 Gallatin's Works, I-462. 90 F.J. Jackson to Mrs. Jackson, October 7, 1809, Bath Archives, 2nd Series, I-17. 91 Jackson to Canning, October 17, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 92 Madison's Works, 2. 49993 Secretary of State to Mr. Jackson, October 9, 1809, State Papers, 3. 30894 Jackson to Canning, October 18, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 95 Jackson to Canning, October 18, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 96 Jackson to Canning, October 18, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 97 Jackson to the Secretary of State, October 23, 1809, State Papers, 3. 31598 Bath Archives, Second Series. I-28. 99 Armstrong to R. Smith, February 16, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 100 Armstrong to Champagne, April 29, 1809, State Papers, 3. 324 101 Champagne to Decrase, May 17, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 102 Armstrong to R. Smith, April 27, 1809, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 103 Correspondence, 19. 21 104 Champagne to Napoleon, May 26, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 105 Napoleon to Champagne, June 10, 1809, Correspondence, 19. 95 106 Champagne to Haute Rive, June 13, 1809, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 107 Armstrong to R. Smith, July 22, 1809, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 108 Armstrong to R. Smith, July 24, 1809, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 109 Rapport à l'Empereur Parle Ministre de la Marine, 7 Juin, 1809. Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts 110 Decret Imperial, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts Volume Z.I. Etas Unis, Piece 166. 111 Armstrong to R. Smith, July 24, 1809, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 112 Correspondence, 19. 261 113 Correspondence, 19. 261 114 Napoleon to Champagne, August 21, 1809, Correspondence, 19. 375 115 Correspondence to Napoleon, 19. 374, State Papers, 3. 325 116 Armstrong to R. Smith, November 18, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 117 Memoirs de Malienne, 3. 133 to 135. 118 Bath Archives, 2nd Series, I-44. 
119 Jackson to Bathurst, November 16, 1809, Manuscripts British Archives. 120 Mr. Oakley to the Secretary of State, November 13, 1809, State Papers, 3. 319 121 National Intelligencer, November 22, 1809. 122 Bath Archives, I-56. 123 Works, 2. 499 124 Jefferson to Gallatin, October 11, 1809, Works, V-477. 125 Grigsby's Tazewell, P-87. 126 Jefferson to Madison, November 30, 1809, Works, V-481. C.F. Monroe to Colonel Taylor, February 25, 1810, Monroe Manuscripts State Department Archives. 127 Madison to Jefferson, December 11, 1809, Works, 2. 460 128 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 1263. 129 Infra, Chapter X 130 Secretary Hamilton to Joseph Anderson, June 6, 1809, State Papers, Naval Affairs, p. 194. 131 Wilkinson's Memoirs, 2. 344 132 Wilkinson's Memoirs, 2. 346 133 Wilkinson's Memoirs, 2. 351 134 Wilkinson's Memoirs, 2. 358 135 State Papers, Military Affairs, I-269. 136 State Papers, Military Affairs, I-269. 137 Wilkinson's Memoirs, 2. Appendix KII. 138 Deposition of John Darrington, Captain 3rd Infantry, State Papers, Military Affairs, I-282. 139 Randolph to Nicholson, December 4, 1809, Nicholson Manuscripts 140 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 509. 141 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 544. 142 Resolution approved January 12, 1810, Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810. P. 2590. 143 Madison's Works, 2. 498 144 Walter Jones to Jefferson, February 19, 1810, Jefferson Manuscripts 145 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 602. 146 Nicholson Manuscripts 147 Macon to Nicholson, April 21, 1810, Nicholson Manuscripts 148 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 1828. 149 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, pages 1855 to 1857. 150 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, pages 1862. 151 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 1864. 152 Annals of Congress, 1809 to 1810, p. 1933. 153 Nicholson Manuscripts 154 Madison to Pinckney, May 23, 1810, Works, 2. 
474 155 Madison to Jefferson, April 23, 1810, Works, 2. 472 156 Bath Archives, Second Series, I 78. 157 Bath Archives, Second Series, I 82. 158 Bath Archives, Second Series, I 118. 159 Upham's Life of Pickering, 4. 172 160 Bath Archives, Second Series, I 109. 161 Napoleon to the Prince of New Chattel, December 19, 1809, Correspondence, XX. 78 162 Napoleon to Marate, December 19, 1809, Correspondence, XX. 77 163 Note pour le Comte de Montalivet, November 16, 1809, Correspondence, XX. 35 164 Napoleon to Fouche, September 29, 1809, Correspondence, 19. 535 165 Memoirs, 3. 134 166 Memoirs de Marmont, 3. 336 167 Note pour le ministre de l'Interieur, December 21, 1809, Correspondence, XX. 81 168 Armstrong to R. Smith, January 6, 1810, MSS State Department Archives. 169 Armstrong to R. Smith, January 10, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. CF Tier Empire, 12. 45 170 Tier, 12. 48, 49. 171 Tier, 12. 50 172 Napoleon to Champagne, January 10, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 109 173 Armstrong to R. Smith, January 28, 1810, Document G Manuscript State Department Archives. 174 Napoleon to Champagne, January 19, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 132 175 Note pour le General Armstrong, January 25th, 1810. Correspondence, XX. 141 176 Projet de Note, January 25, 1810. Correspondence, XX. 141 177 Armstrong to R. Smith, February 25, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 178 Armstrong to Cador, March 10, 1810, State Papers, 3. 381 179 Napoleon to Cador, March 20, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 273 180 State Papers, 3. 324 C. Supra, P. 135. 181 Memoirs, 2. 77 182 State Papers, 3. 384 183 Empire, 12. 45 184 Armstrong to R. Smith, January 10, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 185 Tier, 12. 126 186 Armstrong to R. Smith, July 18, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. CF Correspondence de Napoleon, XX. 
450, 451, note. 187 tier, 12. 117, 188 Napoleon to Champagne, February 22nd, 1810, correspondence, XX. 235, 189 tier, 12. 117, 190 Napoleon to Decrase, July 8, 1810. Correspondence, XX. 450, 191 Note, July 5, 1810. Correspondence, XX. 444, 192 Rapport à l'Empereur, 25 out, 1810. Archives de F. Address. Manuscripts 193 Gallatin to the Speaker, February 7, 1810, State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, I-812. 194 Notes pour le Ministre de l'Interieur, 25 June, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 431 195 state papers, 3. 400 196 Napoleon to Prince Lerbra, August 20, 1810, correspondence, XXI. 53 197 Napoleon to Eugene Napoleon, September 19, 1810, correspondence, XXI. 134 198 Napoleon to Montalivet, August 10, 1810, Correspondence, XXI. 29 199 Napoleon to Montalivet, August 11, 1810, Correspondence, XXI. 35 200 Robert Smith to Armstrong, December 1, 1810, State Papers, 3. 326 201 Armstrong to Robert Smith, July 10, 1810, MSS State Department Archives. 202 Napoleon to Champagne, July 19, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 505 203 Napoleon to Champagne, July 13, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 554 204 Correspondence, XXI. 1 205 Cador to General Armstrong, August 5, 1810, State Papers, 3. 386 206 Notes, etc., June 25, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 431 207 Napoleon to Colin Court, July 1, 1810, Correspondence, XX. 158 208 Gallatin's Writings, 2. 211 209 Gallatin's Writings, 2. 198 210 Armstrong to Cador, September 7, 1810, State Papers, 3. 388 211 Cador to Armstrong, September 12, 1810, State Papers, 3. 388 212 Gallatin to J.Q. Adams, September 15, 1821, Gallatin's Writings, 2. 196 213 State Papers, 3. 387 214 Rapport à l'Empereur, at out, 1810, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts Volume Ziv. Piece 81. 215 Armstrong to Pinckney, September 29. 1810, State Papers, 3. 386 216 Memoirs of R. Plumer Ward, 
I-424. 217 Buckingham Memoirs, 4. 390-218 Wellington to Wellesley, October 5, 1809, Supplementary Dispatches, 6. 386-219 Buckingham Memoirs, 4. 392-220 Pinckney to Wellesley, January 2, 1810, State Papers, 3. 352-221 State Papers, 3. 355-222 Cobbett's Debates, November 30, 1812, XXIV. 33, 34. 223 Buckingham Memoirs, 4. 438 224 Cobbett's Debates, 17. 742 225 Armstrong to Pinckney, January 25, 1810, State Papers, 3. 350 226 Pinckney to Wellesley, February 15, 1810, State Papers, 3. 350 227 Wellesley to Pinckney, March 2, 1810, State Papers, 3. 350 228 Pinckney to Wellesley, March 7, 1810, State Papers, 3. 350 229 Wellesley to Pinckney, March 26, 1810, State Papers, 3. 356 230 Pinckney to Armstrong, April 6, 1810, State Papers, 3. 355 231 Pinckney to Wellesley, April 30, 1810, State Papers, 3. 357 232 Memorandum, Supplementary Dispatches, 7. 264 233 C.F. Lewis's Administrations, 323, Note. 234 Buckingham Memoirs, 4. 435 235 Statement, etc., Cobbett's Debates, XXIII. 367, Note. 236 Pelu Sidmouth, 2. 507 237 Walpole's Perceval, 2. 114 238 Wellington Supplementary Dispatches, 6. 583 239 Took's History of Prices, 240 Pinckney to Robert Smith, August 14, 1810. State Papers, 3. 363 241 Memorandum, Supplementary Dispatches of Lord Wellington, 7. 266 242 State Papers, 3. 366 243 Wellesley to Pinckney, August 31, 1810, State Papers, 3. 366 244 Pinckney to Wellesley, September 21, 1810, State Papers, 3. 368 245 Buckingham Memoirs, 4. 482 246 Statement, etc., December 16, 1811. State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, I-876. 247 Gallatin to the Speaker, February 6, 1811. State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, I-866. 248 Statement, etc., December 16, 1811. State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, I-929. 249 Statement, etc., February 28, 1812, 
State Papers, Commerce and Navigation, 2. 542 to 552. 250 Report on the Finances, November 25, 1811, State Papers, Finance, 2. 495 251 Madison's Works, 2. 477 252 State Papers, 3. 384 253 Madison's Works, 2. 480 254 State Papers, 3. 385 255 CF Speech of Mr. Epps. February 2, 1811, Annals of Congress, 1810-1811, 866. 256 Robert Smith to Armstrong, November 2, 1810, State Papers, 3. 389 257 Works, 2. 484 258 Turo to Champagne, November 1st, 1810, Number 1, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts 259 Turo to Champagne, November 2nd, 1810, Number 6, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts 260 State Papers, 3. 396 261 state papers 3 395 262 madison to jefferson october 19 1810 works 2 484 263 proclamation etc october 27 1810 state papers 3 397 264 Secretary of State to Governor Claiborne, October 27, 1810, State Papers, 3. 396 265 Secretary of State to Governor Holmes, November 15, 1810, State Papers, 3. 398 266 Turo to Champagne, November 1, 1810, Number 2, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts 267 Moyer to Robert Smith, December 15, 1810, State Papers, 3. 399 268 Speech of Mr. Talmadge of Connecticut, January 23, 1811, Annals of Congress, 1810 to 1811, p. 784. 269 speech of Jonathan Fisk of New York, January 17, 1811, Annals of Congress, 1810 to 1811, p. 612. 270 Adams Gallatin, p. 598. 271 Adams Gallatin p. 430. 272 Address to Constituents, Annals of Congress, 1815-1816, p. 1193. 273 State Papers, 3. 390 274 Robert Smith's Address to the People, June 7, 1811. 275 Serreria to Marate, February 17, 1811, Archives de F. ETR. Manuscripts 276 State Papers, 3. 393 277 Madison to Jefferson, March 18, 1811, Works, 2. 490 278 Address to the People of the United States, by Robert Smith, 1811. 279 Jefferson to Madison, September 27, 1810, Works, v. 548. 
280 atoms is gallatin, P430. 281 Macon to Nicholson, February 20, 1811, Nicholson Manuscripts 282 atoms is gallatin, P431. 283 atoms is gallatin, P432. 284 atoms is gallatin, P434. 285 atoms is Randolph, P243. 286 Monroe to Randolph, February 13, 1811, Monroe Manuscripts 287 Monroe to Tazewell, February 6, 1811, Monroe Manuscripts 288 Colonel Taylor to Monroe, March 24, 1811, Monroe Manuscripts State Department Archives. 289 Adams is Gallatin, P435, Gallatin's Writings, I-497. 290 Madison to Monroe, March 26, 1811, Monroe MSS State Department Archives. 291 Serrure to Champagne, March 26, 1811, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 292 Madison's Works, 2. 494 293 Madison's Works, 2. 513 294 Russell to Robert Smith, December 4, 1810, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 295 Russell to Pinckney, December 1, 1810, State Papers, 3. 390 296 Russell to Cador, December 10, 1810, State Papers, 3. 391 297 Napoleon to Champagne, December 13, 1810, Correspondence XXI. 316 298 Smith to Armstrong, November 2, 1810, State Papers, 3. 389 299 Russell to Cador, December 17, 1810, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 300 Russell to Robert Smith, December 29, 1810, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 301 Russell to Pinckney, December 30, 1810, State Papers, 3. 417 302 Russell to Robert Smith, January 28, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 303 Russell to Robert Smith, February 13, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 304 State Papers, 3. 501 305 Ibid 306 Champagne to Serrurier, February 9, 1811, Archives to F. ETR. Manuscripts 307 Russell to Robert Smith, March 15, 1811, Manuscripts State Department Archives. 308 Correspondence, XXI. 284 309 Russell to Robert Smith, April 4, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. C.F. Tears Empire, 13. 27 33. 310 Robert Smith to Russell, March 5, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 311 Marate, Duke de Bassano, P.A.R. Ernouf, 285 to 299. 312 Note Dicti and Concile, 29 Avril, 1811, Correspondence XXII 122. 313 Duke of Bassano to Mr. Russell, May 4, 1811, State Papers, 3. 505-314 Russell to J.S. Smith, May 10, 
1811, State Papers, 3. 502 315 Russell to Bassano, May 11, 1811, State Papers, 3. 506 316 Russell to Monroe, July 13, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 317 Napoleon to Marate, August 23, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 432 318 Napoleon to Marate, August 28, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 448 319 JQ Adams to R. Smith, October 4, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 320 JQ Adams to R. Smith, October 26, 1809, Manuscript State Department Archives. 321 Diary of JQ Adams, December 26, 1809, 2. 83, 87. Adams to R. Smith, January 7, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 322 Diary, 2. 88, 323 Adams to R. Smith, April 19, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 324 Tears Empire, 13. 56, 325 Diary, 2. 143 to 160. Adams to R. Smith, September 5, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 326 Diary, October 9, 1810, 2. 180 to 181. Adams to R. Smith, October 12, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 327 Correspondence, XXI. 233, 234. 328 Napoleon to Champagne, November 4, 1810, Correspondence, XXI. 252 329 Kador to Kurekine, December 2, 1810, Correspondence, XXI. 297 330 Armstrong to Smith, September 10, 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 331 Adams to Robert Smith, December 17. 1810, Manuscript State Department Archives. 332 Adams to Robert Smith, January 27, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 333 Napoleon to Alexander, February 28, 1811, Correspondence, XXI. 424 334 Diary, February 15, 1811, 2. 226 335 Adams to Robert Smith, February 12, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 336 Napoleon to Champagne, April 1, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 3 337 Napoleon to Champagne, April 5, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 28 338 Napoleon to Marate, July 15, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 327 339 Adams to Monroe, July 22, 1811, Manuscript State Department Archives. 340 Napoleon to Marate, August 25, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 441 341 Napoleon to Alkir, December 22, 1810, Correspondence, XXI. 
328 342 Napoleon to Champagne, March 25, 1811, Correspondence, XXI. 510 343 Correspondence, XXI. 506 344 Napoleon to Marate, November 3, 1811, Correspondence, XXII. 552 345 Monroe to Barlow, July 26, 1811, State Papers, 3. 510 Transcribers Notes, 1 Obvious Printers, Punctuation and Spelling Errors Have Been Corrected Silently. 2 Where Hyphenation Is In Doubt, It Has Been Retained As In The Original. 3 Some Hyphenated and Non-Hyphenated Versions Of The Same Words Have Been Retained As In The Original. End Of The Project Gutenberg Ebook History Of The United States Of America, Volume 5, Of 9. Updated editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special rules, set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, Apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook, except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, Complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose, such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances, and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start, full license the full Project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works, by using or distributing this work, or any other work associated in any way with the phrase Project Gutenberg, you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org slash license. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Electronic Works 1.A. By reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, Agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.E.8. 1.B Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.C below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. See paragraph 1.E below. 1.C. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or PGLOF, 
owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying, or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark license when you share it without charge with others. 1.D. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1 The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed, this ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 If an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work, without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, 
including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee, or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8. You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works provided that, you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email, within 30 days of receipt that s slash he does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg trademark works. You provide in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark works. 1.e.9 if you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, such as, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited warranty, disclaimer of damages, except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs, and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, 
breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive, or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund, if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you receive the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express, or implied, including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent, or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion, and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs, and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. a. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark work. b. Alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark work. and c. Any defect you cause. Section 2 Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg Trademark Project Gutenberg Trademark is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged, and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg Trademark S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg Trademark collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg Trademark and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501, c. 3, educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's IN or federal tax identification number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. 
The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, Utah 84116801-596-1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork, and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org slash donate. Section 5. General information about Project Gutenberg trademark electronic works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark ebooks are often created from several printed editions all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks. History of the United States of America Contents of Vol. V Chapter I Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Chapter 4 Chapter V Chapter 6 Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Chapter 9 Chapter X Chapter 11 Chapter 12 Chapter 13 Chapter 14 Chapter 15 Chapter 16 Chapter 17 Chapter 18 Chapter 19 Footnotes the full Project Gutenberg license 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 50, 
51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 20, 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, 128, 129, 130, 131, 132, 133, 134, 135, 136, 137, 138, 100, 139, 140, 141, 142, 143, 144, 145, 146, 147, 148, 149, 150, 151, 152, 153, 154, 155, 156, 157, 158, 159, 160, 161, 162, 163, 164, 165, 167, 168, 169, 170, 171, 172, 173, 174, 175, 177, 76, 177, 178, 179. 180, 181, 182, 183, 184, 185, 186, 187, 188, 189, 190, 191, 192, 193, 194, 195, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 206, 207, 208, 210, 211, 212, 213, 214, 215, 216, 217, 218, 219, 220, 221, 200, 222, 223, 224, 225, 226, 227, 228, 229, 230, 231, 232, 233, 234, 235, 236, 237, 238, 239, 200, and 40, 241, 242, 243, 244, 245, 246, 247, 248, 249, 250, 251, 252, 253, 254, 255, 256, 257, 258, 259, 260, 261, 262, 264. 
265 266 267 268 269 270 271 272 273 274 275 276 277 278 279 280 281 282 283 284 285 286 287 288 289 291 292 293 294 295 296 297 298 299 300 301 302 303 304 305 306 307 308 309 310 311 312 313 314 315 316 318 319 320 322 323 324 325 326 327 328 329 330 331 332 333 334 335 336 337 338 339 340 341 342 343 344 345 346 347 348 349 350 351 352 353 354 355 357 358 359 360 361 362 363 364 365 366 367 368 369 370 371 372 373 374 375 376 377 378 379 380 381 382 383 384 385 386 387 388 389 390 391 392 393 394 395 396 397 398 399 400 401 402 403 404 400 and 5 400 and 6 400 and 7 400 and 8 400 and 9 400 and 10 400 and 11 400 and 12 400 and 13 400 and 14 400 and 15 400 and 16 400 and 17 400 and 18 400 and 19 400 and 20 400 and 21 400 and 22 400 and 23 400 and 24 400 and 25 Four hundred and twenty six, four hundred and twenty seven, four hundred and twenty eight.